welcome back. More than a thousand metropolitan police officers are currently suspended or on restricted duties. Nearly half of them are being investigated over alleged sexual or domestic violence. Admitting that the figures are stark, the Deputy Assistant Commissioner warned that removing all rogue officers could take years. Joining me now, the Chair of the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners, Donna Jones, and Rick Pryor, Vice Chair of the Metropolitan Police Federation. Thank you both for joining me. Let's start with you, Donna. I mean, a thousand officers. Nobody can call this bad pennies or tips of the iceberg or anything of that kind. A thousand officers is absolutely mind boggling, isn't it? Well, yes, it is a very large number and it's a large amount of taxpayers' money that's clearly being spent on police officers who are not currently undertaking their duties to the maximum of their uh, capacity. Uh, but what we do have to do with these thousand police officers is quantify this into the size of the Metropolitan Police, which on average is the size of five other police forces in the country. Now, last Friday, I did meet with Sadiq Khan and with Sir Mark Rowley, the commissioner of the Met, um, and, you know, they went through the plans and they are really being robust in getting rid of the uh, officers in the Metropolitan Police Service who are alleged to have committed miscon or gross misconduct offences. They are talking about having five hearings a day running, as you say, for a long period of time to get rid of those 60 officers a month. And there are two ways of looking at this. One is that the high number means that they are rooting out and they've now got police officers and police staff members coming forward and speaking out confidently to allege things which are not right, not proper, which is going to help to clear up the Met. Let, let me bring in Rick Pryor. Rick, is it true that of these thousand police officers, some of them have committed, you know, fa fairly sort of, um, I I you know, insignificant um, offences? Not all of them are, are, are you know, sinning in, in, in the maximum capacity or not? Yes, I think that would be fair. Um, and I think it's also important to remind everybody right from the off that uh, still the vast majority of police officers out there are good people um, doing their very best in really challenging circumstances, um, often dealing with really dangerous situations. You know, they're rushing from call to call. They're being abused, kicked, spat at, um, rarely enough time to pause for a break. So let's keep that at the forefront of our mind. Um, secondly, I'd like to say as well that... Uh, it's important that my colleagues have the right for a due process to take place. And in the case of gross misconduct matters, you know, legal representation, investigations must be thorough. Um, and most importantly, gross misconduct hearings must be um, demonstrably fair and free from bias, um, which is why we support the retaining of the legally qualified chairs and not this, um, you know, um, move to uh, put police, um, senior police officers um, presiding over proceedings. On the other hand, you know, surely it's important, Donna, to expedite matters because, you know, if they don't hurry up, it's going to be, as you say, incredibly expensive, hemorrhaging money. It's going to mean that a, a force which is finding it hard to recruit and retain is going to find it even harder because we've got a thousand police officers not doing their job. I mean, it's got to be hurried up. Obviously, it's got to be meticulously conducted, but it's got to hurry up, hasn't it? Yes, it has. And that's why the Home Secretary has made that announcement around the expedited Chief Constable dismissal process that was just referred to there. Um, I do think, I agree, actually, that the involvement of locally qualified chairs, basically of an independent person who is qualified and understands police employment matters, is important. At the moment, it's a two-stage process where the Chief or someone on behalf of the Chief, uh, an Assistant Chief Constable or a Deputy Chief Constable, will preside over the case, have a look at it and think, yes, this person has committed gross misconduct, it then gets referred to a panel of locally qualified chairs who will then look at that, consider it, uh, possibly conclude, and then the person is sacked, and possibly also enter them onto a barring list. They can never work in UK policing again. What's happening with the Home Secretary's announcement is it's a merger between the stage one and the stage two process, where the locally qualified chair would then sit on a panel which uh, can be led by the chief constable or a chief officer on their behalf. Um, so there is still an independent involvement, but it is a, um, a move away and it is to speed it up and get rid of people because millions of pounds are being spent at the moment on officers who are either on directed duties or, are who, or who are suspended completely. And therefore that's putting other police officers under undue pressure because they're working in shifts under capacity.
Rick Pryor, what about trust in the police? What about trust in due process? What about trust that, you know, people are joining the police force for the right reasons, they're the right people, they're people who have justice at their heart and at their soul, and you see a thousand police officers invest, being investigated for all sorts of wrongdoing, and how does this contribute towards trust and people thinking well, it's worthwhile going to see the police about something that's gone terribly wrong in their lives? Well, well, first and foremost, if I can address the point of um, the delays, um, you know, it's 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 not true to say that uh, um, changing the system for replacing legally qualified chairs with um, um, senior police officers would speed up the process. That's simply not true. It's not the case. Um, the delays in the system is almost entirely due to um, logistical problems uh, within the police and the IOPC. Um, you know, investigations by the Department of Professional Standards within the Metropolitan Police take roughly a year for gross misconduct to conclude. It then takes another two months for the what's called the appropriate authority cell to make a decision. And then astonishingly, it takes another 12 to 18 months to uh, wait for a hearing to take place where the panel um, can um, listen to the evidence and um, decide whether or not, um, you know, the police officer is... Um, um, found to, to have um, committed the offences that they're um, been accused of. Um, so, so the delays are nothing to do with um, um, who chairs the um, panel. All right, but the, addressing the, the issue of trust in the police, which is pretty pivotal and fundamental, really, isn't it? You want uh, uh, citizens who, when something has happened to them, want to contact the police because they trust that the police have their interests at heart, will do their utmost to make sure that justice prevails, not feel that they really can't because they don't think they'll be heard, seen, listened to, they don't think there are enough people to take any notice and they're not sure they can trust them anyway. That's not what you want, is it? No, of course not. Um, and, um, you know, we would support... Um, the removal of um, corrupt um, police officers um, I I every single occasion. Um, you know, the, our, our point is always, though, that uh, police officers who, by the way, have no recourse to any kind of industrial rights whatsoever, have to be afforded um, the right to um, a fair, demonstrably fair process. And we've got that at the moment. The framework for police misconduct is robust. It's been developed over years. And, um, you know, the, the, it's the failings that we're seeing um, are nothing to do with the um, process. The actual phase, I'd like to see Met leaders uh, um, take, a, take responsibility uh, for some of the um, issues that have um, allowed these um, officers to come into the um, force in the, in the first place. Yeah, you know, yeah. The failures in vetting and recruitment policies, that type of thing. Um, you know, that's where the issue is. And, um, you know, the, the, the lack of accountability for decisions that's led to that um, need to be addressed. All right. Thank you both very much indeed for joining me on the programme.